Mexico has passed the boundary of the United States, has invaded our territory, and shed American blood upon American soil. President James K. Polk. The Mexican-American War begins to take its shape when on April 25th, 1846, Mexican troops fire on U.S. mounted soldiers who were moving along the northern bank of the Rio Grande River. President James K. Polk considers the Rio Grande to be the official border between the United States and Mexico, but Mexico considers the Nueces River, which is 150 miles to the north, to be the true border. Eleven Americans are killed in this skirmish, and over 50 are taken prisoner. When the news reaches Washington, President Polk jumps at the chance to ask Congress for a declaration of war. The president had been jockeying his soldiers into positions of provocation, and now he had that spark to set fire to the dispute over the Rio Grande border. President James K. Polk had been elected two years earlier on a platform of expansionism, and he firmly believed in the concept of manifest destiny. President Polk feels that as part of God's plan for the United States to expand and inhabit the continent all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Peace, plenty, and contentment reign throughout our borders, and our beloved country presents a sublime moral spectacle to the world. James K. Polk. This moral spectacle would fall suspect to the coming actions of the Polk administration. The lands that he most desires are all controlled by Mexico. President Polk attempts to bully Mexico into negotiating the all-out sale of these coveted lands for the paltry sum of $30 million. These lands include most of present-day California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, as well as New Mexico. President Polk is unprepared for the zeal with which the Mexican people resist his advances. In February of 1845, the U.S. annexes Texas, which had been an independent territory. Upon doing so, Mexico completely cuts off its diplomatic ties with the United States and the rift between the two nations deepens to a point beyond visible repair. President Polk sends Congressman John Slidell to Mexico in the hopes that he can urge Mexico to sell their northern territories for the $30 million, as well as persuade them to agree that the Rio Grande is the true border between the two nations. If John Slidell were to succeed in his mission, this deal, would result in Mexico losing over half its land. Mexican officials catch wind of the details of Congressman Slidell's true purpose for being in the city, and they send the envoy home before talks can even begin. In response, President Polk sends troops into that disputed territory between the Nueces and Rio Grande rivers. In his mind, he is doing no wrong and simply moving men into southern Texas. But he knows all too well by now that Mexicans consider this land to be part of their nation. The troops build a fort, and after a month stationed there, the tensions boil over, and the U.S. provocation works in forcing Mexico's hand into action. On April 25, 1846, the Mexican cavalry attacks the group of soldiers stationed near the Rio Grande River, and they kill about a dozen U.S. soldiers. Under the command of General Zachary Taylor, and with the help of reinforcements and superior firepower, the U.S. soldiers are able to prevail at the battles of Palo Alto and Resaca de la Palma. Following these battles, President Polk tells the Congress, The cup of forbearance has been exhausted. Even before Mexico passed the boundary of the United States, invaded our territory, and shed American blood upon American soil. Just two days later, Congress declares war. The declaration is pushed through, despite harsh opposition from some of the northern lawmakers, 
Mexico never officially declares war upon the United States. As the wheels of war begin turning, Mexico sees that they are in a corner, and they turn to their old general, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. He is living in exile in Cuba and convinces President Polk that if he is allowed to return to Mexico, he could end the war swiftly and on terms that the United States would see as favorable. Polk agrees to allow his return, and the moment he sets foot on Mexican soil, he betrays the president and takes control of the Mexican army and leads it into battle. Santa Ana's army suffers heavy losses at the Battle of Buena Vista, and they are forced to withdraw. Despite the setback, he takes up the Mexican presidency the following month. The United States eventually overtakes Mexico City. General Santa Ana resigns, and the United States forces Mexico to sign the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo on February 2nd, 1848, which details the sale of Mexico's northern territories to the U.S. for half of its original offer of $30 million, plus certain damage claims. The territories surrendered in the treaty include present-day California, Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, as well as most of Arizona and Colorado, along with parts of Texas, Oklahoma, Wyoming, and Kansas. This shrinks Mexico by almost half. Mexico also loses Texas permanently and is forced to recognize the Rio Grande River, not Nueces, as the true border between Mexico and the United States. The Mexican-American War lasts roughly two years. The fighting drags on longer than President Polk expects. The expenses, as well as the loss of American life, is greatly criticized in Washington. But President Polk achieves what he sought out to do, but at a much higher cost to the United States than he originally intended. The conflict is seen as one of conquest by some in the U.S., including anti-imperialists, anti-slavery people, and the Whig Party. The war is a defining moment in time for both Mexico and the United States. While the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is signed on February 2nd, just a mere nine days earlier, in the waters of the American River in California, a man by the name of James W. Marshall finds a few pieces of gold near the mill he has been contracted to build and run for Mr. John Sutter. This small and completely accidental discovery would soon fundamentally alter the course of our nation. Within two years, California would become a state as well as a magnet to tens of thousands of Americans and foreigners alike, all of whom seek success and riches in these distant mountains and rivers of this newly acquired territory. Two small nuggets of gold become the catalyst for the largest migration in the history of our nation. John Augustus Sutter, born Johann August Sutter, is a Swiss-born pioneer who leaves his wife and five children and comes to America to escape his personal debts back home. Like many who came to America, the country lent them the opportunity to start over, a new life on new soil, Sutter eventually settles himself in California, which at this time is still a province of Mexico. So, he ventures to the capital at Monterey to ask permission from the governor, Juan Bautista Alvarado, in order to settle. To be able to qualify for land ownership, Sutter becomes a Mexican citizen on August 29, 1840. He soon thereafter receives title to 48,000 827 acres of land on the Sacramento River. He names his new settlement New Helvetia, New Switzerland. With the help of the Maidu Indians, Sutter builds the fort that one day the doomed Donner Party would reach out to for aid. His sights are set on building his New Switzerland and creating 
an agricultural empire. James W. Marshall is a New Jersey-born farmer and carpenter who, much like John Sutter, finds himself kicking around the Middle West of the nation, seeking to find a way to establish himself. After droughts foiled his attempts at farming and falling ill with malaria, Marshall joins a wagon train that's headed west, destined for Oregon's Willamette Valley. Marshall makes his way down into California, where he reaches Sutter's Fort. John Sutter places him under his employ, and Marshall finds his financial fortunes on the upswing. He once again becomes a farmer. Soon after, though, the conflict and tensions between Mexico and the U.S. begin, and John Marshall joins Captain John C. Fremont's California Battalion in the short-lived Bear Flag Revolt. He returns home to his ranch and finds that his cattle have either strayed or have been stolen. With no source of income, he loses his land. Marshall soon enters into partnership with John Sutter to build and operate a sawmill in Coloma, California, on the American River, just 40 miles upstream of Sutter's Fort. While under construction in January 1848, it's discovered that the ditch which drains the water away from the water wheel is much too narrow and shallow to handle the amount of water that is needed to keep the saw operational. Marshall opts to use the river's natural force to do the excavating for him in order to enlarge the tail race. There was no other choice but to take this action over the course of the night, because if done during the workday, the process could endanger the lives of his men working on the mill. On the morning of January 24th, Marshall goes out to examine the progress of the channel below the mill. As he is surveying the developments from the night before, he notices a few flecks in the water, catching the light of the sun and shining back at him. James Marshall's primary focus and responsibility would remain to be the completion of the sawmill. So he sees no harm in his permitting his crew to search for gold during their free time. Perhaps this is why it takes him four whole days before he travels to Sutter's Fort to show his findings to his partner, John Sutter. There, the two men examine the gold further and even reference an encyclopedia to make sure of its properties. They agree to keep the discovery quiet, but little do they know that it's already too late. A young journalist by the name of Samuel Brannan, who owns a general store, has employees of John Sutter purchase goods from him, and these men pay with gold flecks that they have taken from the American in their spare time. This encounter ignites Brannan's curiosity, and he travels to the mill as a representative of the LDS Church where he receives tithes of gold from the LDS workers. Soon, the news that there is gold being harvested from the American River will spread far and wide, faster than the metal can be pulled from the ground. Samuel Brannan takes his newly acquired information and wastes little time in molding it into a means by which he can turn a profit. His general store would soon be selling picks, pans, and shovels to any and all who crossed his threshold with the glints of gold swirling in their eyes. The events that take place in the coming years give rise to perhaps one of the greatest human migrations in modern times. The world is in love, obsessed, enchanted by the promise of gold. Never before in the years that follow has the world been mobilized and drawn to one place with such speed, zeal, and recklessness. An accidental discovery in the American River will end up seducing the entire world. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe.
to help keep history happening.